What's up guys, it's your boy the chat kid coming back at you with a new video. And today it's gonna to be Jeff the Killer reboot part two. Let's go. Jeff knew he was skating on thin ice, but that rage it demanded some sort of satisfaction. Jeffrey, do not speak by these officers in that tone of voice, and do not speak to us that way either. Now it's pretty obvious that you that you two aren't happy here, that you miss your old home, but starting fights in the street isn't going to change anything. Jeff's mother snapped back. Listen, boys, you're lucky. None of the parents want to press charges. This will be reported as a simple scuffle between teenagers, but be advised you're both on notice. This is a quiet town, not like New Orleans. We don't tolerate this sort of behaviour over here. If you see Randy, Keith or Troy, I highly suggest that you tell them you're sorry. We'll be keeping an eye on both of you, so don't let this happen again. You don't want to be a, you won't have an arrest record, do you? Jeff felt that anger bubble over, and he could not hold his tongue. Who is to you? Who is he to you, Officer Williamson? Is Randy your nephew? Is he your friend's son? Or maybe you go over and screw his mum whilst you're on duty. Which one is it, Officer? That's it. Both of you, go to your rooms. Matt Woods apparently found that he wasn't a mute after all, as he ordered his sons out of the room. Jeff and Lou walked upstairs. However, they refused to hang their heads in shame or feel any regret. Neither of the parents spoke to them for the rest of the day. Jeff and Lou stayed upstairs, venting their shared frustrations to each other. They'd been screwed over. Even at their young age, they knew that. They took some sauce in the fact that they'd at least been arrested or cited. But still, they saw what was really going on here. A cop was protecting Randy, Jeff whispered to his younger brother. Oh shit, his brother replied. We have to watch ourselves. We have to take care of each other. You saw it down there. Even our parents still stand up for us. Yeah, what the hell was that? What the hell was up with that? Lou asked. Imagine their fucking image. That's what's up with it. All they care about is fitting in here. They want to make sure they blend in with the rest of the Stepford families. No more fighting. If we see Randy and his two fuckhead friends again, we just walk away, okay? But Jeff, you can kick the shit out of them. Why would you walk away? So I can't kick the shit out of the cops, Lou. Can't kick the shit out of mum and dad. And that, that, that's what would get us. King Randy and his pals are protected here. You and me, we're not. So if you see them, just avoid them, okay? Please? Lou nodded. I feel like a, I feel like a little bitch, though. I owe, I owe Keith for hitting me. No, you don't. I paid him back for that. I paid his, and I paid his frat friend, too. That they just leave us alone now, Jeff sighed. Jeff and Lou didn't hear from their parents for the rest of the day. They were made in their rooms late into the night and finally came down to eat after they, sh after they were sure their folks had gone to bed. Lou, sa Lou said that he felt relieved about that, but Jeff had a sinking feeling that the worst was yet to come. Jeff was correct. The next morning, when the brothers came down to stairs together to eat breakfast, their parents were already sitting at the dining room table, staring at the boys, approving of nothing they saw. Sit down, Matt stated flatly. What's going on? Sit down! Matt stated again, anger dancing on the words. The boys complied without further question. Matt Woods began his tide, his tide, his, his deer tribe. Whatever that was yesterday, beating up some kids for touching your bikes, mouthing off at the police, disrespecting both me and your mother, that stops today. We didn't beat anyone up for touching our bikes, Jeff blurted. Shut up, Jeff, this is a one way conversation, his father barked. That kid, Randy Hayden, his father is a partner in my firm. Did you know that? Did you even think about that when you were assaulting him over your godforsaken bike? You just didn't think, did you, Jeff? Sheila added. How could I have known that? Matt continued. Well, I've spent the entire morning talking to his father on the phone. His dad was willing to let it all go, but shit, son, I had to deal with that at work now. Do you have any idea how much that how much damage this could have caused to me, to our family? Jeff felt that rage coming back, and thought of all his might to keep it stifled. Instead, he, he once more tried to feel to the side of the two adults. Mom, look at Lou's face. They split his lip. Can't you see? It's still swollen. Lou turned his head to, sh to better showcase the injury. My god, Jeff. So some kid played a little rough with your brother. Is that any reason to fight them? I just wanted to make friends with some of the other families in this neighbourhood, but thanks to you, I just don't know. No sooner could Jeffrey's brother construct a proper defence than their father began speaking again. So your mother and I have talked this through. Since there are only a couple of weeks of summer vacation left, we've decided that Lou should spend the rest of the season at Aunt Marcy's place. We've already spoken to her and she's willing to let, uh, let him 
come out there and stay. Both Jeff and Lou were floored by this decision. Both boys began to protest at the same time, but they saw the look on their parents' faces. The decision was made. Why can't we just go? Why can't we both just go then? Jeff asked a last ditch effort to at least get away from his parents. Master doesn't want both of you there, she says. She says the two of you are too rambunctious. And frankly, we agree, Sheila answered. And so it was. Lou was shuffled off to his aunt's place in Abita Swings, Louisiana. A place even smaller and duller than Mandeville, if, if one could believe that. Jeff watched his brother leave and then walked back to his bedroom. He felt that rage. However, it began to feel almost pleasant to him. He couldn't describe it. He was furious at the turn of the events. His parents had turned their backs on their own children. However, through it all, these new feelings he was ex he was experiencing weren't all that terrible. This anger, for example, he could almost taste it. It felt like thick, sweet syrup stirring around in him. Of course, he knew the extra ingredient that would be that would be that would be needed to co complete the flavor. A satisfying joy he'd felt when Randy and his uh, when when he had Randy and his friends on the ropes the day prior. That mixed perfectly with the anger to create some sort of intoxicating product that Jeff almost craved now. He fell asleep lying on his bed thinking about that syrup, that thick, viscous that seemed to work its way to the very fabric of his soul. He wanted it, yet he knew that it was destructive and nothing good would come from sampling it again. Several days passed and tensions were high between Jeff and his parents. Without Lou around, there was nothing for him to do except sit in his room and play video games. He went outside, but didn't venture far from home. He knew if Randy and his goons showed up again, it would likely result in another fight. For a few days, that worked well, and Jeff believed he could get through this. However, his mother changed all that on an early Saturday morning. Jeff was awoken suddenly by a sharp, by a sharp sunlight striking his face. He heard his mother humming, something that she rarely did. Even in his half-sleeping state, he knew that this humming would force. He, she was doing it to wake him up and figured the added sunlight would get things there even faster. When she noticed Jeff's eyes cracking open, she sauntered over to the bed and began speaking in a tone that simply oozed false, false jov, 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 jovialty. At first, Jeff had refused. Could his mother be serious? Did you really expect him to go over and make friends with Randy? He was still in bed when his mother sat her incessant humming long enough to tell him to get up and get dressed. Once he learned why, he told her, no, no way in hell. However, his mother was a shrewd manipulator, and she knew exactly what would get the job done. She promised Jeff that he did this for her, went over and make it work with Randy, that Lou could come over the next day. She'd sandbag Jeff right into the corner with that one. He had no choice but to agree. A short time later, Jeff and his mother were pulling into Randy's driveway. Randy's mother answered the door. Hi, you must be Jeff, she greeted. Jeff smiled wanly and confirmed that, in fact, who he was. Hello, I'm Sheila Woods. Nice to finally meet you in person. Jeff's mother announced, barging past us on an extending a, ran a hand to Randy's mother. Sheila, so pleased to meet you. I'm Bridget Hayden. Sorry to hear that our boys had a little mishap the other day. You know how it is with teenagers, hormones going crazy and all. Randy never gets into fights, but he explained to me that Jeff and his brother are still near around the area and haven't quite learned how we do things in Mandeville yet. Isn't that right, Jeff? Jeff couldn't resist a small jab. Yeah, sorry about that, Miss Hayden. Me and Lou had no idea that it was okay for your son and his friends to mess with our bikes without asking. Bridget, he gets out of mouth from his father, never knows when to shut up. How about you and I go for some coffee and you can tell me all the great gossip about Anderville while our boys get to know each other the right way. Randy's is in his room upstairs, second door to your left. I'm sure you'll hear the sound of his video games or something, Bridget said with very little humour to her voice. Thank you, ma'am. Jeff answered and entered the house. Jeff knocked and ran and heard Randy answer with, Come in! Hey, so, I guess you heard. Our parents want us to hang out, get to know each other. Jeff stated with little conviction. Yeah, that's my mum, alright. She doesn't like drama. Honestly, I think she worries too much. I mean, I'm cool if you're cool. Jeff sat down on the floor next to Randy and struck up, and struck up a conversation. So... Turns out your dad what well, turns out your dad is my dad's boss. He freaked out about the fight in the parking lot. He was actually worried that I'd get fired or something. My dad is like everyone's boss. I fucking hate it. I think half the kids in my school talk to me because their parents are somehow connected to my dad's firm. 
Why'd you hate it? Jeff asked. Because it's fake. This whole damn town is fake. You'll figure out as you go. But trust me, everyone who lives here is just trying to pretend there's something else. My parents make me do all this shit, all the trophies and stuff, just so I can, I can brag. That's it. Jeff smiled. I know how you feel. My dad had me in boxing classes a year ago because some co-worker had, had his brother what worked in the place or something. As soon as that guy quit though, I was out at that gym the next week. I wish it was that easy, Randy responded. I hate playing basketball. Well, my dad will be sure but well, my dad will sure have me out there again next summer and the summer afterwards. It's like he knows I hate it, but he wants to make sure I'm out there with his stupid company name on the back of my jersey. Randy why did you and your friends fuck with our bikes the other day? I told you, this town's fake and boring as shit. There's nothing, there's nothing to do here. We had to find some stuff to do. I mean, there's only sometimes you can go out and hang out in the video store, or ride the dirt past into the woods. All the girls here are stuck up, all the stores close early, there's no mall, and the movie theatre is across town. We were just bored, man. So, sorry for that, I guess. It's cool, Jeff replied. I guess I'm sorry for that too. Things went too far. You mean the fight? Randy asked. That shit was actually quite cool. Those, those guys, Keith and Troy, they just leech because of my dad. It's like I told you, I'm pretty sure their parents make them hang out with me. The next after the afternoon went on, and Jeff soon forgot this was a mandatory arrangement. He actually started, he actually started to find himself quite liking Randy. Sure, their first encounter was a little sketchy, but it was coming around to the guy. Finding wasn't so bad once his idiot friends were removed from the equation. An hour or so later, things took a new turn. Jeff heard the twins. Jeff heard the twin pops of the t of two car doors shutting in near unison, then heard the engine starting up. He dropped the game controller and peered out of Randy's bedroom window, just in time to see his mother and Randy's mother backing out the driveway. My parents are leaving, Jeff said. About time. I figured my mum would eventually talk her mum into going shopping, or to go get coffee, or something like that. Jeff heard Randy pause the game. Hey Jeff, go on downstairs, I want, to show, I want to show you some cool stuff. Randy invited and Jeff followed. Randy led Jeff outside to the garage. It was hot in there with the main door shut. The garage was well kept though and Jeff observed a stack of magazines underneath a workbench as well as tools as very other, as ver and various other utility items stacked about. Standing in the small closing garage with the late summer heat lingering about, Jeff began to feel a little uneasy. Despite the fact that he and Randy had seemed to bond over the last few hours, Jeff couldn't ignore a sense that things were different now the adults were gone. What do you want to show me? Jeff asked. Hold on, let me get it, Randy replied, moving the magazines out of the way to reveal a small red box. Jeff, Jeff watched as Randy removed the box and opened it. Check it out, my dad's flare gun, Randy announced and waved the red tube of gun around. Whoa, be careful with that, Jeff shouted, more of a shock than real concern. It's fine, dude. Don't be a pussy. It's not even loaded, Randy said. However, Jeff watched as he fished one of the flares out of a back compartment. Randy then continued to fiddle with the flare gun, popping it open and loading a flare. Now it's loaded, he announced. My dad showed me how to use this last year when we went out boating. Sometimes I took it out and shot flares at the trees. But this time, I won't need a tree. The Randy change in Randy's voice and demeanour was almost impossible to ignore. Okay, well... Cool gun. Let's get back in the house so it's hotter here. Plus, I'm getting hungry. What do you have to eat? However, as Jeff turned around the small uh, as Jeff turned around to walk through the small door leading back into the house, his path was suddenly blocked by two more familiar faces. Where are you going, Jeffrey? The fat kid, Troy, blurted out as he and Keith stepped forward into the garage. Took you two assholes long enough to get here. I've had to babysit this faggot all day. Randy shouted a wicked joy present in his words. Sorry, Randy, but Keith had to mow his front, front yard before his parents would let it come out, Troy said, a, sheep, a sheepish voice to his son. It's cool. I'm here now. What the fuck is going on? Jeff asked, staring at Randy. He noticed that Randy still had the flare gun in his hand. I'll tell you what, Jeff. You owe me and you owe Keith and Troy an apology for what you did. You sucker punched them and then ran away. You didn't even have the balls to fight them fair, so now you're going to pay them what you owe. I'm not going to fight you, okay? I'm done with that shit, Jeff replied as Jeff glanced around the room for an exit. You're right about that. You're not going to fight. You're going to stand there and let my boys get their looks in. Then I get mine, and when that's done, you get the fuck out of my house. 
I'll tell my mum that you got sick and walked home, and after that, if you see us again, you better walk the other way. I'm not going to stand there and, and, and get hit by your friends, so just let me go home. How, how about that? I'll tell my mum we're cool and everyone wins, okay? Jeff asks. Randy then raised the flag and towards Jeff. No. You stay, pussy. You stay and take your licks. Jeff felt that sensation once more, that sick, rich dark mat that swirled around inside of him. He could taste it now, it was heaven. In his mind he imagined himself diving into it, swimming into it, letting it swallow him whole. He looked around and the sensation only grew. He saw Randy staring standing there with the holding the flare gun. It was limp in his hands though, and the hand was not cocked back. Jeff knew that Randy had no intention of firing it. He looked over at Keith, skinny and pathetic, a kid born to follow. Troy, fat and sweaty, breathing a bit heavy from his walk over, and of course, in the middle of it all, Jeff himself. He felt that pleasure begin to mix with the rage, following the perfect product. He tried to avoid sampling it, he knew that only regret would come from indulging in it. However, when it was placed so close, when the aroma and the promise of that sweet savoury flavour was only inches away, Jeff found he could stand no more against it than a ship in the ocean could stand against a typhoon. Jeff began to smile. Why are you smiling at me? You're queerfing me or something? Randy asked, a slight nervous tinge in his voice. Am I smiling, Randy? I guess because I'm having so much fun, Jeff announced, and suddenly lunged towards the unprepared kid holding the flare gun. Jeff struck Randy once in the nose. Randy's arms dropped, and yet he continued to hold the flare gun. Jeff, without even needing to look, realised that Troy and Kip had actually taken a step back instead of advancing as they should have. Jeff delivered another strong blow to Randy's jaw, causing the boy to drop to the floor. Jeff now turned his attention to Troy and Keith, the two tough kids that, that had yet to make so much as actually move in his direction. Troy actually backed up a step and stumbled over the stack of magazines that Randy had moved earlier. Jeff took this opportunity and stepped forward, once again introducing Troy's round belly to his fist. Troy tried to stay on his feet, but Jeff's punches combined with the stumble over the magazines caused, caused Troy to fall back, landing hard and striking his head on the concrete slab that was the garage floor. Keith was actually trying to back away. However, Jeff was currently standing between him and the only exit to the garage, since the carport door was closed. Jeff took two quick steps towards the skinny kid and felt the most intense joy as seeing, as seeing Keith stagger backwards, knocking back into the wall. That perfect blend of pleasure, control and rage had come together. Jeff felt as though he was floating above the world. Somewhere in his mind, he knew that there'd be hell to pay for this, but at this exact moment, he couldn't care less. He didn't care about Lou, he didn't care about being arrested, and he didn't care if his dad got fired. All he cared about, in that fraction of time, was hurting Keith. Keith tried to make a run for it, hoping to squeeze through the small gap between Jeff and the door. However, Jeff clipped him a hard right to the side of his face, causing Keith to stagger back again. Jeff could see that his knees were buckling and took full advantage. He moved in, pinning Keith to the wall and, and began to deliver blow after blow to the kid's stomach. Keith's eyes became as wide as saucers. Once satisfied, Jeff stepped back and watched the de demonic glee as Keith slowly slid back down the wall, gasping for air. Randy got back to his feet but seemed to have no idea what to do. We done now, Randy? We good or do you and your friends need more? Jeff mocked. No more, we're, we're cool. How about you assholes? Jeff asked. It was Randy's idea, Keith said weakly. Yeah, man, we didn't even want to, Troy agreed. The debate may have continued, but the sound of a returning car broke the tension. Oh shit, my mum's back! Randy shouted, his voice cracking in a humorous way. It seemed that the previous tough guy had, had all but shrunk back into a scared child. So, we'll just say we were hanging out, Keith replied. No, the fucking flare gun! If she finds that, that I mess with it, I'm screwed! So put it back! Jeff suggested that, sens that sensation of rage was fading again, and he felt control returning. Yeah, grab the magazines, please, right, Randy begged. Jeff found that he'd rather like that tone, that begging, whipped dog mentality. Jeff paid no attention to Randy. He was down on the floor, calmly gathering the magazines. He didn't care if Randy got in trouble or not. However, if his mum returned and found trouble, he feared that Lou may not be able to return home as promised. Everything else happened in a flash, both literally and figuratively. Randy, now in a panic over the trouble he'd been if he, caught, if he was caught playing with the flare gun, and begun to sweat. As his hands frantically clawed over the gun, his thumbs pushed back the hammer unintentionally. He didn't even notice that the gun was cocked. He was turning it over in his hands, trying to quickly disarm it. Then he heard the sound of the keys in the front door. 
He knew that Ion had seconds to hide it. Everything else happened in slow motion. The gun slipped from Randy's hands as he'd attempt to rotate it once more. He saw it fall to the floor, seeming to float to the ground rather than fall. Jeff, busy stacking the magazines, had only enough time to register Randy's shock gasp. He turned to, he turned to look in the boy's direction, just in time to see the bright red flare gun hit the floor. The gun discharged, launching a speeding ball of fire directly into Jeff's face. Jeff felt the hot flash of pain and, and of heat and pain tear across the left side of his face. After the initial registry of agony, there was no more thinking. Jeff began to scream, clutching the left side of his face and rolling around on the floor. For a while, he forgot everything as he was plunged into the dark, rich surf once more. The pain almost served to dull the pain. When he, when he finally did come to a stable level of alertness, he realised he was in a hospital room. Half of his face was bandaged, he knew that much. He wanted to open his eyes and speak, let his family know he was awake, but the drugs still had a firm hold. He was awake, but not quite yet functioning. He could hear several familiar voices, though. Is he going to be okay, Doctor? Jeff's mother asked. Oh yes, ma'am, your son will be fine. However, he will have a lengthy road to recovery, and will need your support. The flare struck his face and called three degree burns on the left side of his face. How bad is the eye? Jeff's father asked. Hard to say at this point, he'll need an, op he'll need an optometrist for further review, but the damage appears to be quite severe. And his face? What about his face? Jeff's mother asked, sounding deeply concerned. Well, we were able to clean and treat the injury in time, so you've got no concern for infection or anything of that matter. We'll want him on antibiotics for a while, and he'll need the wound cleaned and dressed on a regular basis, but all in all, your son got very lucky. The damage could have been more severe. Doctor? His mother began again. What if there's permanent damage? What, if we, what do we do about that? His mother asked. As I said, an optometrist will have to examine the eye. Sheila Woods ex interrupted the doctors and more agitated than before. You're not listening! Not the eye, his face! What do we do to correct his face? She demanded. Well, ma'am, we have treated the face. Like I said, there shouldn't be a risk of infection so long as you... She cut him off again. Not the infection, his... his appearance. What can we do for that? Miss Woods, that's hardly, that's hardly a concern at this point. Once he is healed and back on his feet, you can explore plastic surgery to repair some of the damage. But honestly, right now, we can't waste concern on how he looks. What matters is that your son is healthy. He can expect to be home in a few days, maybe sooner. Jeff's dad spoke again. Okay, thank you, doctor. Can we have some time alone, please? My wife and I need to speak. Certainly, the doctor replied. Lou, why don't you go down to the hospital cafeteria and get yourself a snack, Matt Wood suggested. But I want to but I want to be here in case Lou in case Jeff wakes up. Lou, they told us that Jeff is highly medicated. They don't expect him to wake up any time soon. So just uh, just go. If he does come around, we'll have you paged. No. Matt replied. Jeff heard the door open as close as Lou exited. His parents left both let out a long shaky sigh, but Jeff started to believe it was not a sigh of relief but one but rather one of stress. We're going to have to keep him home, Matt. That's that's just how it's going to be. We're going to have to keep him home. He heard his mother ran, her voice sounding frantic. What? I mean, he probably won't be able to start school right on time, but I'll doubt he'll miss a whole year. Father, his father responded, trying to maintain a calmer voice. I'm not talking about that, Matt. I'm talking about him missing a week or two of school. I mean, his face, Matt. You heard, you heard what the doctor said. His face is going to be disfigured. Sheila argued back. We don't even know the full extent of the damage yet, Sheila. It could be may it could be minor, it could possibly heal. And you heard what he said, plastic surgery could be an option in time. In what time? What kind of time? A year? Two years? And what about that in the meantime? People are going to see him and they're going to talk. Is that what you want? He's going to be a a pariah. You think is you think anyone is going to want him around their kids? Jeff was hearing all of this, just letting it soak in. Slowly. As his mind absorbed the words, he felt that rage return. Sick. Sick. Rich. Dark. That syrup of raw, primal emotion. He wanted to scream at his mouth to tell to shut up that he was the one lying here. Half his face burned, blind in one eye. All thanks to him forcing him to go off to Randy's house. He wanted to ask her why she left. Why she went off to go shopping, have her nails on, or whatever it was before she did. He wanted to know as to why she'd leave him with a kid, with a kid who just before tried to jump him and his brother. 
He wanted to know how she could care more about his appearance than the fact that he was lying in the hospital. However, there was still so much more than he wanted to know as well. He wanted to know how, how much more his mother hated him. How much he saw, and that was a, how did he puss it, the pariah. He wanted to continue to swim in that thick pool of dark hatred that was starting to form with rage and anger. This is a new one now. Before I was anger, then it was anger mixed with pleasure. Now it was anger mixed with hatred. And while he certainly longed to be free of it, whilst he most certainly preferred the false sense of love and concern he'd believed he'd heard from her before, he also wanted to test it out a bit more. He also began to wonder, how well would this recipe blend with pleasure? How would it feel? Matt Woods began to speak again. I just can't believe he shot himself in the face of a flare gun. I always thought he was more responsible than that. Don't even get me started on that, Sheila. I couldn't believe it, I couldn't believe it when Randy and his friends explained to the medics and police how it all happened. Randy was just trying to show him around the house and wanted to show him the collection of magazines his dad kept under the garage. You know, boys. He was probably hoping there was a couple of playboys in there or something. And then he said Jeff found the box containing the flare gun and just wouldn't stop playing with it. You should have heard those other boys, Matt. They told me that they practically begged Jeff to put it down and before he got hurt, but he just had to show 